How's it going, everybody? Today on the show, it's all about rapid growth for your business. How's it going, everybody? I'm going to make this short and sweet today. We've got Matthew Pollard on the show, and this entire episode is jam-packed with amazing, useful business information. I'm so ecstatic to bring this to you. I recorded this episode with Matthew uh, a few months ago, actually, and he is definitely the rapid growth guy. I mean, he has, has done it in his businesses over and over again, and he helps people constantly achieve extreme growth in a short amount of time over and over and over again. So hope you're ready for some amazing content. Make sure you stick around to the end of the episode. I've got some information for you on some great giveaways, thanks to Matthew. You know, he's got an upcoming book called The Introvert's Edge, which is in pre-order right now. So he's got some uh, special things revolving around that. All right, let's jump in. Matthew Pollard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, mate. Happy to be here. This is fun. We are traveling. You better put the seatbelt on then, That's eh? right. We'll have they evidence. call about safety. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I am so excited to, to, to have you on the show. I have heard you on numerous podcasts, um, just giving so much value on, on all of them, not not only in what you're currently doing, but just your story as well. Um, so I would love to, to get into that a little bit of um, starting off exactly what you do and what your specialty is. Yeah, definitely. So... I guess my, my speciality is really making sure that a, that a company has what they need to be successful, not just that they have a great functional idea or a great functional skill set. I think a lot of businesses get into that that mindset of, oh, I'll build it and they'll come, or I've got a great skill set, so I'm always going to be able to find customers. And I just, sure. I really, it's really sad for me to see so many businesses close down where they had great intentions and then watching their families break up afterwards. Oh, and wow, yeah. I... I, for myself, I really felt like I went through this stage where I learned how to create business for myself, and now I, I share that with others. I mean, I grew up heavily introverted, as, as you know, um, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my career, with my life, and I, I didn't you know, come out of the gate just knowing how it was all going to work. Right. And I think that is kind of one of the things that makes the message that I have to share very different. It's because I will, I learned to be successful out of strategies, out of systems. I mean, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school, was horribly wow. introverted, and I fell into to sales purely because the company I was working for went bankrupt just before Christmas. Oh my goodness. So all of those things together, it's, it's kind of like sometimes when your back is against the wall, you have to figure things out that most people normally won't. And now I love to share that with other people so they don't have to have their back up against the wall. Oh yeah, and I love that so much about about your story that we'll, we'll, we'll get into some more with some upcoming things that you have but it's such a great point that we don't hear about every day is that you don't have to be the Gary V's who I love it's great but we're not all Gary V <laughs> out there self promoter and everything yeah. not everyone's as obnoxious as I am for instance you know yeah. um, it, it doesn't come naturally to them so and I think that's that, that's so valuable but but what was that what did you do early on? Because there's some some great success there that I want that I want to touch on. Yeah, definitely. Right. So obviously, I, I think what you're talking about is my bio, which is I've been responsible for five multi million dollar businesses before I turned thirty. Yeah, I think phenomenal. to put that in perspective, though, as I said, I what I, what I did is I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I made the decision to go out and um, and, and get a job for a year to really figure that out. And then I worked for a real estate agency for that. Well, the goal was to work for that real estate agency for a year and not to be the salesperson, to be the person in the back office that no one spoke to. Right. And yeah. just really to find myself and it went because bankrupt. That's, and that's where you felt comfortable. I mean, it was your natural yeah. setting, in it very inward. and Exactly. I mean, introverts, you know, they don't want to be the person that's out there trying to make sales or the person that's the center of attention. I mean, for yeah. me, I wanted to be the center of attention until I was and then I was like, oh God, how do I get out of this? Uh, now I don't want to. I think that's an aspiration for many. Like, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, they you kind of feel like they have to be the center of attention. And sure. for me, I had to learn that skill of how to behave around that. Um, when I was, you know, in my, my early life, it wasn't about that. It was, I wanted to be the center of attention. 
but realistically that was something in my head it's not something I actually wanted so I wanted to be the person that was trying new things out testing new things and to be an entrepreneur I'm able to do that and sometimes I had to learn some strategies to cope and I think with the real estate agency that went bankrupt before Christmas I kind of got forced out of a job that was going to keep me safe for a year but in Australia we have a year sorry sorry at Christmas we have a whole month off. So we go on holidays from the 20th of December to the 20th of January. There's like no decision maker in town during that period. So how do you get a job? You can't. Of course, commission only salespeople, those those companies are hiring. So I got a job working for a commission only sales company and you know, after five days of great product training, no sales training, they're like, here's a street, walk down it. Wow. 93 doors of walking door to door trying to make a sale to businesses that made it very obvious that I needed to go and get a real job, that I was ruining my life and that I was getting in their way. I mean, I felt horrible. Well, of course, because you you do. Exactly. You, you're intrusive. You're not comfortable already. You weren't given sales training. Exactly. What, what were you selling? What was the product? I was selling telecommunications door to door. And yeah. we were actually saving people money. And a lot of people that feel uncomfortable selling their products are selling, saving people money. And at the end of the day, $20 saved is equivalent in a lot of businesses to $80 made. Oh, and yeah. some businesses only make $80 in a day, right? So it's important that people do save money. But I felt like I was getting in people's way and that I was being intrusive, as you said. Right. So. What I struggled with was trying to make that sale. And it, as I said, it was 93 doors of rejection, being told to get a real job, feeling miserable before I made that sale. But I sold him everything. And I remember making $70. I was ecstatic about the wow. fact that I made $70. And then I got to the stage where I, I remember I was for about 90 seconds, I was just ecstatic. And then I had this realization I had to, I had to do that again tomorrow. Oh. And that was not okay. Yeah. So for most people, I guess they'd probably quit the job or they go, this isn't for me. But my back was against the wall. I promised my family I'd support myself. I didn't come from a rich family. So I made the decision that I was going to find a way. Horribly dyslexic. Couldn't exactly pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar. It would have taken me a year to learn it. So what I did, and you know, I wish podcasts like this existed or YouTube channels existed back then that were really focused like this. But what I found, and and, and sorry, there was YouTube back then, and I found YouTube. And YouTube, I learned to sell completely through that. Now, there wasn't a collection of videos, but piecing together videos that people had put on back then, Mm -hmm. that made all the difference. And every day I got better and better until I think it was about six or seven weeks later, I was the number one salesperson in the nation for the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. That's incredible. So what was it that, what was it inside though that made you say, there has to be a way, there has to be a, a formula or a system or some steps out there? to go find that definitely so I I think a lot of people get in their own way and they focus on why it's not possible right so you've got the people that are very negative they're like it's not possible and then you've got the realists and the realists are going to explain to you why it's not possible (laughs) right that's the only difference people are incredibly (laughs) negative but when you've got your back up against the wall and you have no other option your brain does this weird thing where it says well we need to find a way it's like Apollo 13 right they landed, it was impossible. They figured it out because there was no other way. Right. Right. One of the things that we do when we get in our own way is we go, that might be hard or it's not possible. And as soon as we start thinking like that, our creative brain, brain switches off. Oh yeah, you go down that road to just, yeah. Well, that's it, it's over for you. Yeah. Now, what I do differently and what I've learned since then, I think, and, and it was a mistake the first time, I now recreate it continuously, which was, My brain may ask this question, if it was possible, how would I do it? And then I got the surprise that there's more than cat videos on YouTube, (laughs) right? I put on YouTube and I was like, I bet you I can figure out whether there's a sales system in there. So I typed in sales system and I learned the steps of a sale. Then I learned all of the individual steps one at a time and it got better and better. Of course, I wasn't fantastic the next day and people in our population, you know, in the community these days, they want instant gratification. It took me two weeks to become good It took me six weeks to become exceptional and every day I put more work into, I I did the nine to five of trying to sell and then I did the nine till midnight of learning to sell and then I went back and it was six weeks. So there were two things. One is that I made a decision that I had to find a way and the idea presented itself. The second was I made the decision that I was going to put in the work and the result appeared. And I think that's so valuable, so valuable because it is a decision and people can 
like, oh, well, how do you do that? How you, but it is. It really is that decision. It's not, I feel like it. If I feel like it when I come home, but it's just a decision. And there's, and I think we all have that somewhere. If you look for it, if you really look for it, but you have that, that moment that you say, it's not up to feelings or opinion anymore. This is just what will happen from this time to this time every day. And phenomenal things will happen. Yes, six weeks amount of time, but that's nothing to become a top salesperson. Well, and but you ask a six-year-old whether six weeks is a long time, <laughs> they'll tell you that's a long time. Right. The problem is that adults still look for instant gratification and live in the moment. Right. right? And one of the things that they, they teach this with children now, they they'll give them they'll give them the option of having one marshmallow now or two in a few hours time and they'll pick the one marshmallow now very very quickly because they don't understand delayed gratification just yet and it's very important to teach children delayed gratification a lot of adults though still are not okay with delaying gratification so coming up to christmas all of my friends had gone they were going to university so they were all drinking and they were having a blast during those six weeks and calling me continuously going, Matt, come out. We're going to have a great time. <laughs> What's one home. night? What's one night? Exactly. Yeah. Now, obviously, I was introverted anyway, so I, I was pretty good at saying no. <laughs> but it was still difficult because I used to say no to sit down and watch a good TV show that I liked right. or doing something that I enjoyed. Learning how to do something uncomfortable oh, was not yeah. something that fitted in my mindset either, but it had to be. And I think that that's one of the things that I've learned. Like every business that I've started, every business I've been involved in, uh, we're we're gonna talk about Small Business Festival in a second. And you know, I didn't sleep during two months of that. (laughs) But now something exists that never existed before. Mm -hmm. And it's because I put it together, right? So it's very, very important to give up periods of your time, not lifetimes, but periods of your time to create something or learn something you can leverage forever. And oh, I think yeah. that's one of the things that I, I think separates me as a successful entrepreneur to a lot of the other people that fall by the wayside. I agree. I agree. And that's and, and touch on at least you know take us through a, a, a couple of those businesses that you have started, and, and, and then also you know what brought you to Austin, you yeah, know, definitely. from that. So my first business was a telecommunications company. So again feeling unsafe about trying something different. I was successful in telecommunications, so I decided to open up my own telecommunications company. And what had happened was I actually was earning high six figures. I was, well, well, high six figures by me at that stage, which was I was earning somewhere between $150,000 and $200,000 a year just as a door-to-door salesperson. And I was working about four hours a day. Like it was, um, it was the easiest job on the planet once I figured out that six weeks of skill. Yeah. Then I got promoted. My commissions, I didn't have as much time to sell, but I got to build a team and I got more commissions off them. Then I got promoted again. And what I found is every time I got promoted, I still had the opportunity to sell, but I had less time to sell. I worked longer hours and I made less money. Wow. Then I got promoted over to Adelaide, which is the equivalent of getting sent to, I'm gonna think of a, what's a very small state in the US that we could use as an example? I guess Rhode Island or, okay, yeah, so, yeah. So Rhode, Rhode Island. So I got sent to your equivalent of Rhode Island. Okay. And I got asked to start a, um, to fix the office there. And when I got there, there were two people in my entire team. One were, had cancer and was showing up oh, two gosh. days a week. And the other one, I swear to God, I feel like he was homeless. He was just coming in to shave. And I mean, it's commission only sales, right? So, you know, with, they take everybody. Right. Now, within the, within the first month, I completely disappeared, recruited my team, didn't have time much to sell, but I got given a salary, which was forty thousand, sorry, $35,000 a year. So I'd given up this massive paying job, oh, man. So, sorry, well commission, right. to go and do this because it was about creating a career at 19. Then I'd gone over here, I'd, I built the team, and over the space of four months, I took it from that horrible state to it was out selling your equivalent of New York and Los Angeles together. It was wow. the number one state in Australia for sales for products. And it just, it grew so rapidly and everything was so successful. I was back to earning close to 200,000 with commissions and that sort of thing on average on a monthly basis. And then my boss called me and said, Melbourne's fallen apart since you've left. Can you come back? Which is like saying, can you come back to New York? And I said, listen, I would love to, it's the head office. I would love to come back, but you've got to look after me this time. They said, no problem, we'll look after you. When I got back, I'd replaced myself with my my favorite team manager. I got back and they offered me 45. (laughs) And I said, what do you mean you've offered me 45? And the KPIs were so high, I was gonna struggle to make money. And what they said is, they said, Matt, you're 19. 
where are you going to find a job that pays you that kind of salary? Wow. You're lucky to have it. Rather than you've done this for us. Definitely. You're this valuable. Yep, exactly. So wow. I went, I, I actually was considering it because, you know, I'd always been growing up on safe job. Um, sure. And it was, you know, it was one of those things. It was still, he was right. Where else was I going to get a job that paid this? That was all I knew. And I remember going home and my father said, Matt, you're 19. This is your only, sh- you know, when you're young, you've got a great opportunity to go out and do something for yourself, right? If you've got a job, you've already lost. Don't uh, be like me. Now, my father was the corporate guy, but he was the corporate guy because he was growing up two kids and he needed to have something safe. Right. Now, I've since learned that you can be safe while taking risk, right? As long as you manage your time effectively, you can start an entrepreneurial venture while doing business. But my father was so focused on the fact that safe job, safe job, that was not something that was in his mind as okay at the stage. Right. But I did. I went and made the decision. I remember I opened up my first business on top of a Subway restaurant. And within the first 12 months, we turned over a million dollars. And within three years, we were the number one. Uh, we were the largest business-to-business brokership for cell phones in the country. Wow. Now, that was, you, you know, your equivalent of, we were a brokership. So we were your equivalent of my cricket for consumer, but mm-hmm. we were for business. Okay. And so we grew ridiculously big and it took three years to get there. Uh, go, fast forwarding, you know, through a bunch of other businesses, the one I'm probably most proud of uh, is an educational facility, um, and that was we we grew from nothing to three and a half thousand students or business owners within three years. It was the fastest uh, growing school in the country. That's incredible. And so that was all what I did while I was in Australia. Then I made the decision to move to the US. And real quick before that, too, let's dive in a little bit too, because because you're good at sales doesn't mean you're good at running a company. Oh God, no! So, so how did that next set of <laughs> skills Same manifest? Thing, learning. Okay. So it was firstly, I was smart enough to learn to reach out for help. Okay. So there were lots of things I didn't know, and I would reach out. I had great. I had a great accountant. I had a great lawyer. I had a great person. I had a person that would come in from year two and help me with the growth of the business. I hired a business coach. Okay. Right. So there were lots of things there, but also I learned like crazy. I would consume YouTube videos still. I mean, we look at who I am now. I listen to three, and I say listen because of my, you know, my, my reading disability. I'm not reading three books. That would right. be the next ten years of my time. Right. But I, I'm not dyslexic, and it would be the next ten years. Of my oh. time. I'm an audiobook guy all the way. <laughs> and it is. It, but the thing for you, it's a, it's a choice, right? Mm-hmm. But you, let's say you're driving to work. You can't read a book. But apparently, that's frowned upon. Right. right? Apparently so. <laughs> So you're not reading a book during that time. So what I, what can you do? You can listen to Audible. So I so I listen to Audible. I listen to three books a week, and I mean I, I you know I came to Dallas, and during the commute to Dallas, you know I listen to Audible the entire way here, and I oh, listen yeah. to Audible the entire way back. I'll have two to three books read, you know, within this time. Why? Because I listen to books at three times speed. Yeah. Right. So I'm you know, and I have to say this is a learned skill. You'll notice probably by this interview already, I speak kind of fast. <laughs> Australians speak fast, so we already hear faster. But oh, it's a nice. learnable skill, mm-hmm. right? So start at 1.25, you know, right. then st- then go to 1.1 and then go to 2. You'll find you'll step up quickly. And even me, if I don't listen to an Audible, like during Small Business Festival, there was no listening to Audible. I right. was <laughs> hell for leather for two months. And then when I got back, guess what? I was back to 2. And, you know, I had to concentrate. And now, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, I'll be back up to 3. But oh, yeah, that's, it, that's how I learned the information. It was continuous learning. Mm-hmm. Education doesn't finish when you leave school. And oh, yeah. as a matter of fact, all of the, the stuff that I need to know to run a business, I didn't learn in school. I went back to do my MBA. I got invited to go and do one. And that was phenomenal. And I learned a lot. But how to apply it in the real world, you need other things for that. And the body of knowledge needs to be more up to date. And while you learn a great foundation in your educational courses and your university subjects, you need to have another body of knowledge. And the, oh, yeah. the only way you're going to get that is there's huge amounts in podcasts. I mean, I know I share a lot in mine, um, and I know that you're sharing a lot in yours, but you still need to leverage to books. You need to leverage to YouTube videos, but you oh, can yeah. consume information so much more. I mean, everything that we have today when we look outside is as a result of the fact that they invented the printing press. Right. Because now we got we got to learn faster, and then technology advanced, and now we have Audible, and look at how fast everything's growing as a result. Just exponentially, yeah. And and that's the that's the that's the biggest travesty of the educational system right now, even higher education, is that it's not just what you're not getting, it's a matter of that they're not saying 
keep learning after. Here's how to learn better. That's the big. That's the most valuable thing that you could ever learn. <laughs> oh, look, I agree. I think the most valuable thing about an educational course is that it it helps you prove that you can learn, mm-hmm. but it does kind of teach you how to pass a test. Right. <laughs> and the real test in life is actually life, right? <laughs> Having a business that doesn't fail. And one of the things, I mean, I'll give you an example. Like we had a, a book that we had to read for high school, which was To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm-hmm. So what did I do? I watched the movie because yeah. there was no other way I was going to do it. Now, what what did I do next? I watched the movie because reading the book for me would have been a ridiculous amount of effort. Mm-hmm. And I was already struggling in school. So I watched the movie. But then I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite logical. The book and the movie are going to be different. So what I did is I started having discussions with people in class about the difference between the movie and the book. (laughs) So now I know what the differences are, so I now know how to write my essay so that I can focus on it. I learned how to learn in a way that suited me. But this is the problem. For me, the way the world worked did not work for me. So I had to find other ways. The world works for a lot of people just well enough that they don't go and look for other options because they can always pull up a book. They just choose not to. Right. For me, unless I found ways to adapt, I couldn't be successful. Right. So, or, or what could I say? I couldn't be in the minority. So I either had to be below the minority or exceptional. And I chose exceptional. Awesome. And a yeah. lot of people just go, well, you know, let's be honest. I still get to eat. I still live in a house that's okay. There's right. power. If I compare my life now compared to someone in the 1960s, <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. Right. But that's not how I judge my life. Right. And I feel like we need to pretend that we're in a situation where we, you know, where where a company that we just worked for has gone bankrupt and we have to find a job quick or we need to find a solution quick. And that's the thing too, is because it can so quickly. It's just it's mind boggling to me. This illusion of safety for so many folks is still there. Because it really is an illusion. It can just be turned on its head. And I get it. Not everybody's naturally an entrepreneur or or driven to that or drawn to that. But we're getting more and more every single day to where even if you're, you know, the cubicle worker and plan to be that for the rest of your life, you better prepare in some form or fashion. Well, let's let's get more specific than that. So... I, I don't like motivational speakers that say everything in the world's possible. So let's talk about the science behind it. Okay? We're presented with two million bits of information every second through all of our senses. Scientifically proven, two million bits of information every single second. Right. Our brain, supercomputer as it is, it processes 126 bits of information. So what it does is it deletes, distorts, and generalizes everything that we see. On the basis of our values, our beliefs, our past experiences, and a subset of that is our goals. Now, I talk a lot about, um, in in one of my episodes of my podcast, which is Better Business Coach Podcast, Mm -hmm. episode 17. Fantastic, by the way. (laughs) You enjoyed that one? Yes. Yeah, I think I sent that that one to you. That's right. Yeah, that sure is. It's very good. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, in in number 17, I talk specifically about how to set these goals and why it's so important to be aligned with them. Mm -hmm. But just talking from a having a backup against the wall perspective... If our brain says we have options and we don't have to focus on this, our brain tends to have a scattergun approach to how we achieve things. So what it does is it focuses that 126 bits across a plethora of different things. If we have our back up against the wall and we're like, we have to find a solution to that, guess what our brain's focused on 100%? All of a sudden, we see opportunities that were right there in front of us the whole time. So you talk about someone like Pat Flynn, who lost his job, his wife was pregnant, he had to find a way. What do you know? He did, right? And you always yeah. find every single person that has their back up against their wall has one of two options. One is to go and look for support, and that happens frequently, and especially in the societies we live in today. We look for support, we go borrow money off mum and dad, or we expect the government to support us, or we do all of these things, or we go, I need to find a way. I will find a way, and they, the, those kind of people always do. And I think that's one of the really important things. And when I talk about goals, what I find is a lot of people have that scattergun approach to goal setting. So the brain's like, oh, well, I gotta focus here and here and here, and they're conflicting and there's barriers there, so they don't know what to do. Right. So what I always suggest to people is they find three business goals, three personal goals, one incredibly selfish to themselves. And then what they do is they really focus in on this, use smart criteria, specific, measurable, and time-based. And obviously I go a lot more detail into this in episode 17, but what I then say is summarize it in 250 words or less, including why it's important to you. 
And the reason why that's so important is we kind of inherit our goals, right? We hear our mum and dad talk about goals and we're like, oh, that sounds cool, I'll go do that. We hear our cousins and friends say that. We hear our best friend in college, you know, the drunk guy that was next to us telling us about what he wants. And we're like, that sounds cool, we'll do that. All of a sudden, you know, going forward 20 years later, we're still focused on these things. And they were never important to us. And you don't remember why. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they were never important to you. It's yeah. just when you're young, you're still figuring things out. Like oh, yeah. one of the major things I always get people to do is try and follow, you know, figure out what their goals are and how they relate to their passion. Mm-hmm. And most people, when they're writing their whys, they realize it's been so long that they've been focused on making money and taking the safe choice. That they've given, they've given up their God-given right to doing what they love and being a master of their own domain. And all of a sudden, by creating these goals and summarizing them in 250 words or less with the why statement, all of a sudden they're like, you know what? That wasn't important to me. This is. And all of a sudden the energy goes from this to this and the opportunities they see are just there. Like I'd like to say that a lot of the success I have is because I'm a fantastic coach. But realistically, sometimes it's a matter of just getting them to see what they've never looked for before. And then they go, you know what? I want to do this. This is how I would do it. Oh, I could speak to this person, this person, this person. Now all of a sudden, they're being successful. And then all I'm doing is guiding them along the way. But it's so valuable. That accountability and that focus and that tiny bit of reframe is night and day for somebody. Well, you think about it though. How many entrepreneurs do you speak to where they go, I'm doing this, 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 and this? Or I kind of don't know what I want to be doing yet and I'm trying to figure out how I can make money. Right. Yeah, because they just want to be an entrepreneur. So they've right. identified that they want the flexibility, but they haven't identified what their passion is. Well, their passion is derived from what they want. Now, the best way, now obviously I would like to say a passion is our sense of purpose. And that is kind of our unconscious saying, this is what I'm put on this earth to do, this is what my gift is. But the closest we can get logically is to work out what our goals are. Once we know what our goals are, all of a sudden our, our unconscious goes, oh, this is how I want to do that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, but that takes time pondering. I mean, when was the last time most people, and put the challenge out to everyone watching, sure. when was the last time that everybody sat there for more than five minutes without pulling out their iPhone and said, <laughs> I want to do, so, what, what do I want to do? What do I really want to be doing? Yeah. Why is it important to me? And blocking out time to do that. Generally, and if you know, if it's a, a housewife at home or a single mother or a, you know, a person that has a full-time job but then has to come home and there's kids, we don't find five minutes. But we, if we had to invest in a house, we would spend time doing the due diligence. But when it's our Great entire point. existence and how we invest our entire lives, what we don't, we don't do that. Right. That's ridiculous. That's a great point. That's a great point. This is such valuable stuff that I love. But I want to get. I do want to get back to your story because there's there's several nuggets I want to pull out sure. coming up. So what what did bring you to the states? Brought you to Austin? What what, what made that transition for you? Well, so I, I decided to make a couple of decisions. So the first one was every time I grew a business past a certain size in Australia. Because Melbourne was only five and a half million people. Okay. Um, then you'd have to go to other states. Mm. And Australia, for people that don't know it well, it's the population of Texas across the landmass of the United States. <laughs> so you're always in a plane. It's nuts. Like, literally, people, when I talk about the fact that I drove from Austin to Dallas, right, that's a three hour drive. I put in a, an audio book and I drove here and, and it was fine. I had some yeah. great meetings and I'd prefer to have my car. It was actually quicker than getting on a plane and get, hiring a car and doing all that sort of stuff. Right. However, I drove from a population of a few million people to another population of a few million people without having to get on a plane, right? If I did that in Australia and I wanted to fly to Perth, well, I'm on the plane for at least three or four hours on the way there. Like, it's the same as going from Austin to Los Angeles, right? So what I wanted to do is there were two things. One was I wanted to sell to a populace that was much more highly saturated, a bigger market. And America is definitely that. I mean, 320 million people, sure. you know, in the same, you know, dem- you know, same land mass, unbelievable. But also 20 million people within a three hour drive, right? Which means that that's phenomenal for me. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is that I wanted to, I wanted to test what I did in a different demographic. Mm-hmm. And what I did is, so in Australia, I know what I do works. And it became less exciting for me because my passion is to create rapid growth. And if you've created rapid growth so many times in Australia, you want to try a different demographic. So I wanted to see what would happen here. But then when I got here, what I realized is that every business I grew grew went from nothing to 50 staff in about three years. And I just made the decision that what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to teach people what I do. And I wanted to be able to teach people how to do it without giving up that opportunity of a lifestyle business. Uh, So what I decided to do, and I'd never built a website before, mind you. 
is I decided I, I, that, that that means I'd actually paid people to build websites for my businesses. Mm-hmm. But I was the guy that would say I need this word changed on the website, and I would email and I'd spend like the next week chasing him up to change the <laughs> the into a they, right? right? Because I didn't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And then I made the decision uh, last year, in early last year, that I was going to build a website. So I just read every book on the topic and you know did all the research that I did. It only took a few weeks. Very similar to selling, right? right. So I learned. Web WordPress, and in February last year, I launched my website, and it went from no traffic, like all websites do. By the way, I didn't pay for extenuating amounts of at Google advertising or Facebook advertising. I think to date, my entire budget for advertising, which has just been some testing, some things for fun, I think I've spent about twenty dollars. Wow. Right, so I don't spend money on advertising because there are so many free ways to do it. But within nine months, I was inducted into an international sales blog hall of fame. Wow! I launched my Twitter profile in May of last year. And within seven months, I went from nothing to the 43rd most retweeted business coach on Twitter, listed by Evan Carmichael. I've won, you know, I've won sales and marketing awards. All sorts of things have happened as a result of doing that. I mean, my podcast hit new and noteworthy in three separate continents in video and audio format just in 24 hours. Wow. Right. So what it is, is everything that I do is applicable to the bricks and mortar business that wants to grow from one store to 10 stores, to the pers- the big corporate organization, I just got back from speaking at Electrolux, to the you know the small home-based business that just, for them, rapid growth means earning a stable six-figure income. Right. And what I've realized is that there are three things that they don't understand. Differentiation, message unification, how to separate themselves from everybody else, right, outside their functional skill. Right. You know, finding that niche of clients, and the reason why they struggle to find their niche specifically is because they don't know who they are. Once they know their goals and their passion, all of a sudden their niche becomes pretty obvious, especially once they know what their unified message is, the one piece of value that they offer. And, and you the, walk people through that. That's exactly that. what I do. Right. Yeah, so there, I mean, there are a lot of things that I now do. I mean, as you know, I do small business festival, but predominantly what I now do is I help customers across the world obtain their unified message, understand their niche, and develop their sales system. And unlike most coaches, I don't really struggle to get clients. Like, I have a waiting list for months. So I only work with people for a period of six hours. And at six hours over six weeks, I only work with four to six clients a month. Um, and the reason for that is what I find is a lot of coaches, they try to hold on to their client because if you can hold on to your client, you can now make a six-figure income. But if you lose one, most business go coaches can't sell. You've got to get another. You've got to get another. And that's why my podcast teaches business coaches how to sell. But for me, I've got a waiting list a mile long. So what I do is I give them all the tools and strategy they need to obtain rapid growth themselves. For me, that's my drug. I love creating rapid growth. So to be able to teach them those strategies, to see the rapid growth, to actually get them to a return on investment in that time, and then to say, cool, you've got it, go for it. You know, I get that forever, you know, to to know that I was able to allow that person to help the world in that one thing forever. And I love that. And that's that's so core that, the order that you, you walk people through that to find that unified message, then focus on their niche, and then the, then it's the tools, the tactics, how to sell to them. So it's so important that it's in that order. There's no way to do it correctly the other way around. Well, I think what's interesting is modern day marketing strategy talks about you have to define the market, then define the message, and then the sales system. The problem with that, especially in professional services, I mean, you know for yourself, when you're trying to tell someone who you are, if you have to say, I'm a business coach, right? First thing is, that's you trying to put yourself into a box. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're a business coach, or you know, I've worked with ghostwriters, I've worked with real estate agents, you're still saying, saying I'm a real estate agent, I'm putting myself in a box. Now, when you're trying to get a job, it's important that you fit in a box. When you're trying to be an entrepreneur, it's important that they can't put you in one. So that's a very big difference that people have to get their mindset over. But secondly, going back to marketing strategy, if we define the market, then define the message, we have to bend ourselves to the market, which means we're being disingenuous and we're being incongruent with who we are. Right, no matter where you go from there. Exactly. There's always that little bit of piece that's missing. Because we're bending ourselves to a pre-established market. Now, we now live in a global economy, which means if there's one client, there's thousands of them. So what I always suggest people do is understand what their goals are. Make sure they have a mindset of what if. And then once they have those goals absolutely focused, then have a look at what their unified message would be and what their niche would be. But define the message around the goals and then work out the market that fits. And by doing it that way, you're now completely congruent with who you are as a person. And the market 
is excited to work with you because you're the only person that helps that. And think about it, everybody has their own unique competencies. Everybody has their own upbringing. Every single person will be able to help one demographic of people better than most other people. And that should be what their branding's around. Oh yeah, I love that. And I love that differentiator. But going back really quickly, because it is counterintuitive, right? Because it's, walk me through this this step too, because at, at one point, you don't want to be put in a box, like you yep. mentioned. So first off is how do you not do that, but still be able for someone to consume you, right? You want yep. you want that easy consumption of, oh, I can use your services quickly, but also, you know, you don't want to be in a box, and yet you still want to niche down in your marketing, in your target Yeah, you don't area. want to be in a box, but you want the box of people to like you, right? right. So <laughs> what you do is... Okay, so let's let's use an example. I think that's probably the easiest. Okay. So uh, there was a client I worked with called the Beijing Language Academy out in California, and they were teaching Mandarin to adults and kids. Mm-hmm. Now, their major problem was they were trying to charge fifty to eighty dollars an hour, and they were working in a demographic where people were stri- uh, where people were coming into the country from China and from other states of the U.S. to open up their own business. Now, what do we know about people that are opening up their own business? They're willing to cut their prices to the bone to get their first clients. Sure. So they're op- on Craigslist offering language coaching for 20 to $30 an hour. And Wendy's not even, she's paying her staff more than that, right? right? Because the staff want to earn good money, they're not gonna cut their prices so the, the big business can earn more, right? Right. So as a result, she was struggling to get new clients and she was struggling to retain the clients she had. So she comes to me and she says, Matt, how do I compete in this overly saturated, highly competitive market? And I said, Wendy, I, I want you to avoid the battle altogether. So what I did is I identified with Wendy that there were two clients that she worked with and it was only two that she helped with more than just language. One of the things she helped them with was understanding the, the, uh, the importance, uh, so she was helping them understand Galaxy. Now, let's say you and I are in a meeting. When we first start talking, we're gonna start developing a rapport, making sure that we can get along. And then we're gonna start talking business. In the Western world, we're gonna start talking business straight away. And then within that meeting, I'm probably going to ask for the sale. If not, a week later, at the most, I'm gonna call you back and say, hey, do you want to buy from me? Sure. And then if you say no, give me another week, you're kind of dragging your heels. I'm guessing it's probably not going to happen. Now, in China, they want to meet with you. They're, the word galaxy is their version of rapport or the word they use for rapport. Okay. But what it means is they actually want to meet with you probably four or five times before they even start speaking business. They probably oh, want to wow. go out to dinner several times. They probably don't want to see you drunk over karaoke just to see the kind of person you are. Right? Because for them, they're not talking 12 and 24 month contracts. They're talking 50 to 100 year deals, wow. right? That's longer than a lot of people's lifetimes, yeah. right? It's more important to them rather than the terms of the contract that they know who they're getting into bed with. I mean, that's longer than some people's marriages, right? Right. So you have to go through that dating phase. So she helped them understand that. She then helped them understand the, import- the difference between e-commerce in China and the e-commerce in the Western world. And then thirdly, she helped them understand the importance of respect. See, in China, the, the whole idea of respect compared to the Western world is vastly different. If you give me your business card, and let's say, you know, I'm not sure if I've got a card on me, but I don't. So if you gave me your card, I'd go, oh, thanks very much, I'd put it straight in my pocket. In China, they'll get the card, they'll hold it, they'll cherish it, they'll look at it, and they'll stop talking to you, or look at, well, they'll stop looking at you at least while they're talking to you, and they'll let you know how much they appreciate your card. Yeah. And then they'll pull out their card case, they'll slot it in, and they'll put the card case in their pocket. That's respectful. If we were to just throw it in our pocket, that's the end of the deal. There is no more business to be had there. So in China, respect is vital. And one of the other things that most people don't understand is learning Mandarin ain't gonna cut it when you're doing business. You need to focus on your accent. Now they don't expect you to sound exactly like them. They do expect you to be respectful enough to try. Wow. So these things actually help people to get better outcomes when they go to China. And I said, Wendy, you're doing so much more for these people. What are you doing? For her, she's like, what are you talking about? There's just a couple of things above and beyond. And I'm like, Wendy, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume that as a result of helping these two individuals, you're going to make them more successes, more successful in China? Her response to me, well, yeah, that's kind of the point. Right. I said, so what if we called you the China Success Coach? What if we called your organization the China Success Institute? And what if we called the program the China Success Intensive? Oh, now, this yeah. program doesn't focus on teaching them Mandarin. I mean, you can do that for 20 to $30 an hour. And right. while you offer that, this program specific focus is on teaching you the things you need to know to be successful in China. Genius. We crafted a five week program. 
was a five-week program that worked with the executive, the spouse, and any children to help them be as ready as possible to go across the channel. Now, why the executive, the spouse, and their children? Well, firstly, we're in business. You can charge more. But secondly, imagine you got relocated to China. Now, are you married? Yes. Okay. So imagine you going to China. Do you have kids? Three boys. Perfect. So your wife and your three boys come with you. You have to work 80 hours a week right now to get what you're supposed to be over there to do done. If they're not coping, do you think the kids will act out? Do you think the wife will want you to be your wife will want you to be home more often? Oh yeah. You're going to be less successful in China if they're not succeeding in China. Therefore, it's important that the whole family unit is successful, and therefore, as a corporate sale, the corporation is, of course, going to be more happy to pay for their education too. So now, what we've got is we've got a five-week program that works with the executive spouse and the children. This is a $30,000 program. So we've gone from struggling to sell at uh, at, at $50 to $80 an hour to having a $30,000 program. Now, it gets better. What we did is we went, well, who are the type of customers that, sorry, who's, who's partner, who could we partner with? And we went, well, hang on a second. What about immigration agents? Immigration agents have to do a visa for people to go to China. Now, an immigration agent, you know, for me to work in the US, I had to come through an immigration agent, get a visa to come here. Okay. This is what you have to do when you go to China too. Now, the amount of paperwork, the amount of work required to get a visa to go and work in China is ridiculous. And they charge about two to $3,000 to do oh, it. Oh, wow. Now, can you imagine getting the offer and saying, these people need to be successful when they get there. I'll give you $3,000 at the end of that doing the visa to say, congratulations, you've got your visa. I just want to double check that you've got, you know, you, you know you're know, you ready as ready as you can to go and be successful when you get there. They'll go, yeah, sure, we've got the house organized. We've, we've looked, The kids are getting pretty good at Mandarin. I think we're set. They'll go, no, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you better speak to the China success coach. Booking them an appointment, Wendy gave them $3,000 for any successful sale. They're now making more money with no work to do that than they are doing the visa. Oh, yeah. So Wendy is now getting, though, hot leads. So she's making a $30,000 sale rather frequently on these calls, and she has no hard sell. She's making $27,000 for a a five-week program with no hard selling. All because of the power of this unified message. It separated her from, she, I mean, it was something she was doing anyway. And this is what I mean about getting outside your functional skill. Right. I mean, if you're a ghostwriter, the reason why people buy you is not because you write great books, because that's what everyone else does. No one's going to pay you more to write. Right. What they're going to pay you more, like another one of my clients, is he crafts this great authority through the book. So we called him the authority architect. Now, all of a sudden, he's got this thing where he says, you know, do, do the ghost, other ghost writers you've spoken to, do they do authority architecture? Well, of course they don't. He invented it. Exactly. Right? But now it's this thing. And they're now asking them whether they have this process and they don't know what he's talking about. But secondly, if they do do it, they're not going to do it in the same way. They're not going to have a strategy. They're not going to have a system. And if you've got 70 grand to spend, right, you're probably going to speak to my ghost writer. Oh, you're not God. going to speak to them because you feel safer knowing that he has a system. Oh, yeah. That's true. So, so that's what you mean by not being in that box because the box, putting yourself in the box is I'm a ghostwriter or I teach language. Getting outside of that and said, oh, well, that's just a little piece of what I, what we do is, that's, oh, it's fantastic. I love that stuff. And a lot of people have to look for this. I mean, when you say it's really hard to make money in printing or it's really hard to make money as a ghostwriter, it's really hard. I mean, think about it. I've got a, a good friend of mine now and, and past client uh, who was a, copy, a copywriter. And he was known as the autoresponder guy. And he was, he did, you know, he had one of the top 30 podcasts in the US. Made less than $50,000 a year though, oh right? Had 80 customers a year. And because let's face it, an autoresponder is that email campaign that sends out. Right. Now, if you're the most expensive, you can charge about $1,000. Why? Because people that know what autoresponders are, know they can go to Fiverr and get a cheap one. Right. So if you can get a cheap one for $5, the spectrum of what you're willing to pay, well, actually, people are willing to pay up to 50000 but it's a hard sell and there's very few people and the marketing's hard. So for him, he's like, I can, I can get about 1000 but it's hard selling at that point. Anything sure. higher than that, I really struggle. We rebranded him as the re-engagement catalyst, right? And then all of a sudden, we went to e-commerce stores that had these massive budgets, and now all of a sudden, he's got recurring clients where he just makes the emails better, charged $12,000 a month on a recurring basis, picked up three clients in a few weeks, Jeez. makes more money than he ever did before. 
doesn't matter the industry, it matters the competency that you have, what specific skill set you can deliver, and who you can get a return on investment or provide an outcome that no one else can. Fantastic. I love that. Walk me through, because I want to make sure we hit on this. You just you just finished in Austin, which is the Austin Small Business Conference. It's the Austin Small Business Festival. Festival. So we decided calling it a festival, you can bring alcohol in the mix. <laughs> nice. Right? So why not? <laughs> nice. And this is monumental in scale. I mean, that's what I, it's the world I live in, corporate events, and I know what it takes to put on this any any event, much less something of this this scale. Walk me through what you what you just put on. So we put on, so it started off with an idea. I said, I want to create a festival that provides one paid forum for people to come to and a bunch of free events riding across Austin. Okay. So I went, I, what I did is I spent about, about six months picking the team that I wanted to work with, right? So I was doing what I was normally doing while selecting individuals that I wanted to work with. And I put together a meeting at about, about six months before the event. And I said, guys, I want to put together an event. And we had a few meetings about that, but it was a great team. And what I did is I said, here's what I want to do. And about 60 days before the event, I walked into the city of Austin's office and said, hey, I want to do this. We hadn't, we didn't have a single sponsor, not a single sponsor at that stage. We didn't have a single person that was a headliner to be on our stage. And I had a meeting with um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, David Altunian, who's the MBA professor at St. Ed's. And he said to me, Matt, I think we're going to have to be realistic here. 60 days from the event, this is not going to happen. <laughs> and I said, for me, I always have to live in this world of what if. So I said, if you're not going to be positive, no place for you at the seat to right. sit down. And he, so he reframed. He actually called me a week later and apologized because within that week, we picked up the city of Austin and Capital One as major sponsors. Wow. We just secured sp uh, speakers like Jim Cathcart, the number one most internationally award-winning speaker on the planet to wow. speak on our stage. But we, in the space of that 60 days, we put in and we put in 70 different speakers over 12 locations. Good grief. We had Google Fiber give us their location space to run it from. We had so many other location spaces volunteer their space to, to work from as well. And we had, you know, people like Ryan Dice who doesn't get on a stage of less than 2,000 people. Oh yeah. The ticket prices of generally what, two to 3,000? Yeah, well he spoke on our stage completely for free because he believed in the cause, he believed in the mission. Within that 60 days, we got the city of Austin behind us we got the governor's office to commit to supporting us for the following year. And the SBA is now to, uh, gave us a full endorsement and spoke to everybody in the audience. The mayor showed up and spoke at the, at the kickoff party. We received a proclamation from the city of Austin. The governor's office presented a, a proclamation to the mayor and to me and to the head of Capital One for our involvement in it. Wow. We had more than 20 radio and TV interviews within two weeks of the event. And we had 1,200 people register for the event within the space. We only marketed it for 20 days. Good. And what that was is, again, was crafting a very, very well-structured message that got people behind it. And what was that message? That in Austin, Austin's more than tech, there needed to be a forum, a collaborative conference that allowed all of small business to get together and talk about what worked. But more than that, not to have speakers that get up and say, hey, here's the strategy because I read a textbook and now I'm presenting it. But people pay me $10,000 to speak. People that actually want to give back that have physically gone out and physically done it. Right? We had people like the founder of Bizarre Voice, uh, sorry, Bizarre Voice, uh, sorry, Bizarre Voice, who created this multi-million dollar company out of, out of it, it was a technology business, but also the founder of Finley's Barbershop, who has a bunch of um, stores here in Dallas, um, a bunch of stores in Austin. But you know, if you can make money out of cutting hair, which you can't make money out of cutting hair, ask <laughs> anyone, he does. Wow. Right, he spoke on our stage and talked about how he did it and what his belief system was. And that's, and I think that's what's so valuable. I, another guest who's been on the show, Erin Smith, she she put on an event recently, um, Entrepreneur Summit, to to do exactly that, which is bridging the high tech startup we hear about every day, sort of world, and the barbershop, like you said, the bridge exactly. those, because there's some really common threads that are so important, and I think. I think things get missed on in both camps when when we don't bring those together. Definitely, and the thing is, I mean, my last business was, as I said, educational facility, right? And I was amazed. I would have the CEO of Harris Scarf in the same room. Well, Harris Scarf is your equivalent of Macy's. Okay. And a 
a barbershop owner in the same room and they're sharing ideas and they're talking about oh well you know our big corporation's having this issue well you know in our barbershop we use this technology and i think that would work in your corporate next thing we know it's implemented that's, right so creating wild, that collaboration yeah. is phenomenal and i mean i think that we also created a forum where all three levels of government can also collaborate on how they help small business and i think that was inherently powerful but i think that the main thing is that we created a forum where all small businesses could come and learn from people that have actually done it. And I think that's why, I mean, Inc. listed us as one of the top five uh, collaborative conferences for small business in the nation. I mean, wow. Twitter listed us, the actual physical Twitter blog listed us as the number two profile to follow for National Small Business Week. We were right below the SBA and right above Google for Business. That's right? incredible. 20 days, no one knew, you know, we only launched 20 days before, before that, only the sponsors knew that we were doing it. Wow. So that was a tire that just yes. flew off that, wasn't it? Sorry, folks. <laughs> yeah, this uh, big truck was trying to avoid that tire. We were trying to help him. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's incredible. And so, and it seems to be, there's definitely a common thread into everything from your podcast to your business to your selling approach to this conference is rapid growth i mean yeah, definitely i mean it's it's rapid growth around small business right so i do work with corporate and i create unbelievable results for corporate organizations but my passion my love is helping small businesses obtain rapid growth it's what i've got a, a product launching in october called the you know it's, it's around rapid growth yeah. about teaching small businesses how to obtain it i work with four to six clients a year i've got a book coming out about teaching small business sales skills i i focus my podcast is about teaching business coaches how to be better at what they do because i it drives, it drives me crazy when a business coach sits down and you've got the local pizza shop who's hired a business coach to help and the business coach sits down and says, so what would you like to work on today? Well, I don't know. That's why I hired you. Right. right? So the whole focus for me was teaching business coaches, A, how to sell so they could let the clients go once they actually had the tools that they needed so they could stop being in the expense channel. But B, be successful at what they do and providing them templates so they can actually provide more value for longer as opposed to, I mean, it's generally the way a coaching cycle works is they work with them, the coach tries to hold them because they're terrified to use them, uh, to, to lose them, but don't know how to continually help them. And eventually the business owner goes, you know what, I did have a good experience with you at the start, but now you've kind of overstayed your welcome. Right? right, and that leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Oh, so yeah. there are two things. One is that it, you can actually create a coaching program. So for me, I give away these templates during the podcast that actually teach people how to facilitate a coaching session so they come in with outcomes they're trying to get for their clients every single time. But secondly, teaching the ideologies on how to be a better coach and thirdly, how to sell coaching so that, I mean, I'd like to, a lot of coaches will say to you that they charge $200 an hour or $400 an hour or whatever they say. A lot of those coaches, if you negotiate with them, they'll coach you for a hot meal because it's been so long since they've had a client. So for me, I hate that because these people are trying to, they're trying to help and they're passionate about helping, but they don't know how to message how they help. They don't know how to actually physically help when they get there because they come, a lot of people have come from corporate America or they have one functional thing that they help with, but they're trying to do so much for so many people because they don't know how to target their direct audience. Right, right. And tell me your, your other initiative, that we have coming up is a new show, a new podcast. Can't give all the details away, but but it touches on something that I think is really valuable that isn't talked about very much. Yeah, definitely. So uh, what you're talking about is my introverts podcast. So the the focus for me is that I'm I am highly introverted. And I mean I mean you see me on video. I don't come across introverted. These are all strategies. These are all systems that I use. I, I've become great at telling stories, but you can go back and check all of the other podcasts I've done. I've done almost 100 of them. Wow. You can go back and see me speaking on stage. Guess what? All the, stay, all, the, all, the, all the talks are focused on the same stories because for me as an introvert, I need to have something to have it as a system that leads me through the process. It's all about making sure I can deliver the exact same thing because otherwise I get nervous. Okay, for me, when you ask me a question that I'm not expected, and I, I said to you beforehand, you know, ask me any question you want, there's nothing out of bounds. Right. Why can I say that? Because I've practiced so much good luck catching me out, right? As an introvert, we prepare more than everybody else. But I use strategies to prepare, I use strategies to be prepared for an interview like this. When I get up on stage, it takes me 30 minutes to get in the mindset, right? Jim Cathcart and I are great friends. Jim Cathcart's the number one most international speaker in the world. Um, 
he, sorry, award-winning speaker in the world, and I am a guy that's terrified to get on stage. <laughs> yeah, we're great friends because he knows. Well, he when it, when he heard me speak, he goes, I, "I, you know, I can't see that you were an introvert." Right. And I said, "Here's why." I said, "For the thirty minutes before I prep, I jump up and down. I focus on my mind. I, I you know, for three hours before, sometimes I'm practicing my slides, or I've gone over it the day before, and I'm absolutely in the zone. And my terror creates a wonderful adrenaline rush." that makes me perceived as an introvert. But most people don't know how to harness adrenaline and it turns straight into fear. Uh, and they I, shut down. Exactly. Right. So when you know how to harness it and direct it into energy that you share, it comes across as passion, it comes across as love for the audience, and it comes across as giving more than anyone else. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah. that's the power that an introvert has. And what I'm, what I'm looking to do throughout that podcast, so check out my website, matthewpollard.com, if you join any of any of the things on there, where you give your email address, you'll get an email about this new podcast that's coming on, where I'm actually going to give away strategies, the strategies that I use, and I'm also going to bring successful millionaires on the podcast to talk about the strategies that they used to become successful, and for them to get out of the things that they were getting stuck in to become successful introverts. That's yeah, that's fantastic because, and, and I've heard you make this point that that differentiator is because. You can show up and and go through those systems and those strategies every single day, no matter if you're having, you know, the extrovert can have a great day and be wonderful, but then, you know, they just happen to have a fight that morning or having an off day. Well, then everything goes to crap because that for them isn't there. But if your system is here again, 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 you're always going to succeed. You're always going to hit it. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I I, I spoke at Electrolux uh, in January, and I, I got on the stage and I spoke there. And it was a thirty hour flight up, it was a thirty hour flight back because it's the only flight. I mean, they booked me in December wow. for for February uh, for January. And, and what, what was it? It was in Bangkok. Bangkok. Okay. So, firstly, there is no way I would have said yes to that ever. But here's the cool thing: my grandfather used to sell Electrolux vacuum cleaners door to door. So I was like, "This is cool." Like my grandfather used to sell door to door, which is the job that you know is the the job that no one wants to do. Right. And now I'm advising on their corporate strategy. How yes, I'm going to go. I oh, moved yeah. a bunch of things to make that possible. That's awesome. But I got up on stage, and it was a custom speech, but I'd practiced it, so I was incredibly jet lagged. I'd arrived the day before, but here's the thing about China. They wanted to take me out to dinner three times before I presented. So what time did I have to prepare when I got there? I was very well prepared. I prepared the morning of, but I was still jet lagged. But guess what? No one else could tell. I got an adrenaline rush because I get one about going on stage, which yeah. gave me the energy that I needed. But next, I knew my story so back to front, or how Americans say it, front to back. Yeah, everything's backwards in Australia. <laughs> I knew them so well that it didn't matter. By the way, that joke, completely rehearsed, said it a bunch of times before. Right, so the whole thing was about just delivering what I knew I could deliver. Then when I got back on a plane and I got back, I had a bunch of pre-booked calls. So one of the things I allow with my audience is when they join my mailing list, they I, I basically give them 13 steps on how to create rapid growth for themselves. Because my focus is I get too many options of working with too many people. So I try to teach you how to do it yourself. And I get huge numbers of people saying to me, Matt, thank you so much. You know, my business is successful. I just implemented what you said in your emails, which is great. But also I allow people to book a 30 minute phone call with me where I don't sell on those. I literally will go through and work out exactly how I can create rapid growth in your business and tailor that advice to you during that 30 minutes. Now I had like nine of those phone calls booked in for the Friday I got back because I didn't want to move that entire day. But here's the thing, I was jet lagged, but a lot of what I do is scripted. So even though I was customizing advice, I was pulling on that story and that story and this story and this piece of advice that I've given before, all of it was stuff I've done before. Yeah. So as a result, I could do it on autopilot. Yeah. Which means my brain didn't need to think. Now, go back to an extrovert for a second. Now, I've worked with, you know, I've got a, a I worked with a guy from Collier's International who was a massive extra, extrovert. You know, two parents that were both salespeople by nature, massive extroverts too. And he was like, come on, mate, you can't teach me anything about how to be a salesperson. You're an introvert. Therefore, <laughs> I'm more natural than you. And I went, let me teach you, a, let me tell you a story. And I told him a story. And the whole story was about giving me credibility and about talking about how to use stories to develop credibility. <laughs> So it was like this, he got entangled in this story. He's like, all right, I've got to take this guy seriously, but I still don't think it's going to work. Went out and tried it. Collies International in, in Austin has three salespeople and their average turnover is about three million a year. Within six hours of teaching them this, they were working on bigger deals than they've ever had before. Bigger accounts, people that they would never have normally got into the door with. They put a million dollars on their bottom line 
for potential wow. sales within just six weeks of working with me during the you know, telling this story. So it works for extroverts too. But the thing is, an extrovert is we have a good day, or, or they have a good day. And they're like, I'm a successful extrovert, you know, I'm having a great day, making lots of money, I'll go and make a sale. And they always say, for an extrovert, when's the best time to make a sale? After your last one. Why? Because you're having a great, you, you, you got the right. great buzz on, right. right? I mean, you go to Brian Tracy, he'll talk to you about that. You know, hop on, he'll say, best time to sell after you make your last sale. That's kind of the same for introverts too, slightly. But for an extrovert, it's exactly the case. But then, when's the time that's the worst time to make a sale? Straight after you have a fight with your wife or, or, or wife, girlfriend, husband, boyfriend, right. right? Or best friend, or let's say if, if, if you were my customer and you just turned me down hard, I go into my next sale, kind of you know shrugged out, I've, I've lost my energy, and oh, yeah. you know, it's over for me. So as an extrovert, your ability to sell, your ability to negotiate, your ability to go in and ask for a promotion is 100% locked into your personal uh, sorry your personality and how you're feeling today yeah. as an introvert it's a hundred well it's about 90 percent locked into the system and the strategy you're using so for me yeah sure i was a, i was flat when i got back from the electrolux conference so sure. i probably delivered to about 90 percent, but not 10 percent. right and my results with what i did were probably almost exactly the same so the focus for me is systemize the process and then your emotions, how you're feeling. Let's be honest, we all have those dark days. Of course. And those dark days, most people won't talk about them. I've had them, I know you are. And knowing that you can just turn on a system and I mean, it's like pressing play on the program and the program just runs. That is absolutely the introvert's edge to being successful. Oh yeah, and that can be applied all the way down to all the systems of running your business. The value there is so great that you you take that approach rather than, oh, when I feel like it, I'll get these emails done or I'll make those sales calls or I get these, these, you know, whatever you need to get done to move your business forward. It's that daily incremental systematic approach. So all, everything that you teach can be applied to across the board, way, way beyond even sales and marketing. A hundred percent. I mean, I apply the systems to sales and marketing because what I find is that's where most businesses struggle the most, right? right? Getting their first clients, coming up with a message. I mean, a lot of no I, I work with new entrepreneurs a lot of the time as well, and these people are just they're trying to work out what you know what their gift is and how they can provide it to the world. And sometimes they just need help connecting themselves to the goals. Other times they need they need understanding on how they would word that to get people engaged with their brand. And as right. I said in my in the email sequence, I actually give a five step process. It's not the strategy I use but it's the best I could do. It took me a week to write the, the strategy that I could come up with to help people create rapid growth for their own business. And it gives them a five-step process for how to come up with that unified message. I did this at the, the National Freelance Association. And you know, there was over 200 people in the room and about 90% of the people put their hands up when I said, do they now feel like they've got a better message um, than before? But about 95% of the room put their hands up and said this was the longest time they'd spent on marketing, which is horrifying. Oh, it was a 45 minute workshop. Oh right, goodness. so I focus on that because I find that a lot of people don't know how to create rapid growth. So that's where I spend my energy. However, I mean, you apply what I do. I mean, I've applied this to business coaching and that's why I've got the templates, right? I systemize the process of coaching, right? I've applied what I do to, uh, to telecommunications. Like my first business, I had this whole tray system that expedited, you know, expe uh, that created a faster process. Expedited is the word I was looking there for. That expedited the process of going from I've made a sale to the person's cell phone is now with a different provider. That's gotcha. right. All these systems, then I build technology. So for me, I've got a, um, a deal that I've just worked with one of the, the biggest speaker bureaus in the nation um, and you know, uh, um, unbelievable speaker bureau to help because uh, I created a product that will allow them, uh, allow all the speakers to show the, their, their events in a much more effective way. And there's oh. nothing out there in the world like that. So what did I do? I wanted one, so I created it for me. And then I'm like, okay. oh, I should probably sell this to some people, right? <laughs> right? So I always am fixing problems. Introverts have this wonderful ability to look at a problem and search for the solution. And they're not going to just jump from project to project, they're going to finish it. So for me, I do the exact same thing. I do that, but what I've decided to do is focus my attention. So it's all about finding that passion. So for me, I focus my 100% of my passion around creating things that pro provide rapid growth and helping and aiding small business. That's awesome. I love it. I love all this insight. I appreciate you sharing, sharing all of this. 
once again, your website to find you and find you on the social, matthewpollard.com? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you type in Matthew Pollard in Google, I'm pretty sure I'm the entire page. Yes. So you can definitely <laughs> type in that. You can t- obviously find me on LinkedIn at uh, LinkedIn forward slash, dot com forward slash Matthew Pollard speaker. Uh, you'll find that on Twitter as Matthew Pollard underscore. Uh, and on Facebook, I'm Matthew Pollard speaker as well. But really, just type me in, in in Google. You'll find me. You'll find a bunch of articles I've written on Entrepreneur, CEO, uh, Inc. You'll find me everywhere. And all of the content that I write is really about helping you do this yourself. So please consume it. And then if you've got questions, feel free to reach out. Fantastic. Matthew, thank you so much for being on. More than welcome, mate. Hey, Happy well, to be here. I'm just going to drop Excuse you on the me. side of the road here. Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, perfect. That's what happens after all my okay, interviews. Perfect. Okay, perfect. I hope you were as blown away during that episode as I was um, when we recorded and watching it back. Just, just some amazing lessons there for for anybody in business. Now, as I promised, we've got a couple of giveaways here. Number one is an extra audio that Matthew recorded for us um, after that podcast, which outlines his entire launch strategy for when he launched Better Business Coach podcast. Um, so it's not only the steps that he took to make sure that he did show up and new and noteworthy and really exploded not only the podcast but the business, but it also he also goes into some strategies on making sure that you leverage yourself and your expertise the right way when creating that podcast. So make sure you go to thejasoncroft.com forward slash Matthew, M-A-T-T, H-E-W, and all the show notes are there, including the way to get that free audio. Now, one more thing is that, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Matthew has a book called The Introvert's Edge available for pre-order at Barnes & Noble and Amazon. And he let me know that if you purchase from either Barnes & Noble or Amazon and then send him an email with that confirmation link to Matthew at MatthewPollard.Guru, he will send you the first chapter of this brand new book. And... I've read it myself. It's fantastic. It's just wonderfully framed and very uniquely um, just positioned that teaching so that it's it's a it's the really perfect mix of both tactics and case studies that he goes through. It's all at that same page, thejasoncroft.com forward slash Matthew. Make sure you pick up that book, get that first chapter, and really dive in and, and start enjoying that right away. Thanks so much for checking out the show. We'll see you next time. It's Saturday night. It was Saturday night and I'm feeling kind of silly. When the coat on cause the air was chilly. But I'ma make my way out to the record spot. Gotta find some new breaks for the beats to rock. I gotta come with the flavor like some lifesavers. Or now and later it's got to be maker. If I'm a player it's like a take deck. And if you miss the gig then take a rain check. Stacks of wax piled high to the ceiling Need a U-Haul truck if I would think about stealing But it's not my speed so I commence with the digging No kidding, something that'll keep the beats hitting while I'm getting So much to choose from bro